The virtue libertas, freedom. Freedom is a virtue aspired to by all cultures. Southwest Airlines prides themselves on lowering their cost and keeping their cost under control so that they have their customers have the freedom to fly. If you, what dentists need to focus on is giving your patients the freedom to be able to afford your great dental care. Thank you, Judith. The trouble with dentistry today is, with so many institutions around the world, is that nobody is quite sure what the goal is. No one's quite sure what the ultimate end, even of their existence is. Why do you go to work every day? What is the big picture? You know, I love it when you try to think of yourself as nothing more than an army ant. And you got the queen ant, or you're a bumblebee with the queen bee. You have to know your mission. Um, you have to know, if you know the end today, it's so easy to know where to go. For instance, if you're a oil tanker and you're leaving a Houston terminal, if you know that you're going to go exactly out the Gulf, down to the Panama Canal, and swing all the way over to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, or Jeddah, um, then it's, a, it's an easy thing. But if you don't know where you're going and you just trail out into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and start going in circles, um, your life is not as profitable, it's not as productive, it's not as virtuous as it could be. Uh, today's dental mission statement is very clear. From day one, back in, uh, I got out of school May, 7th, May 11th, 1987, opened up September 21st, 87, with our mission statement, uh, to build a long-term relationship between our staff and our patients so we can provide quality, consumer-friendly dental services the whole family can value and afford in a happy and healthy environment. True success is when everyone involved with you and your organization, the employees, the customers, the patients, the management, the owners, the entire community, all grow in self-actualization. Um, today's dental is a small teams of great people doing wonderful things. The employees of today's dental are dedicated to promoting optimum oral health with emotional passion for a profit. The goals of dentistry Dental service should simultaneously improve the overall quality of the dental appointment experience while trying to control the largest possible percentage of the revenue and profit associated with their dental experience. The competitive radar screen, um, the new patient exam, the hygiene recall update questionnaire, the checkout customer satisfaction survey. Um, when you do a new patient exam, you know, are you asking them when they come in? First of all, you know, if a 20-year-old person calls up Today's Dental, uh, they're going to answer the phone, uh, thank you for calling Today's Dental, how may I help you? And they say, I'd like to schedule an appointment to get my teeth cleaned. Um, have I, I'm sorry, your name is? Uh, it's Jim Jones. Um, have we seen you before? Uh, no. Oh, well, you got to be thinking, okay, are you 20 years old, never been to the dentist? Um, did you just move to Phoenix? And you got to ask them right then, well, did you just move to Phoenix, Arizona? Um, Yes, great. Well, who was, your who was your last dentist? How long have you been going there? Um, did you have a good experience there? Um, so many people look at the receptionist as someone who should sit behind a brick wall, behind a slide window, or customers come in, knock on the window, and they slide open and hand them forms to fill out and close the door back. And we're talking about a relationship between your staff and your patients. And this relationship, you have to realize the front desk in any other business would be sales. These people are your telemarketers. These are the incoming line. Um, when you're going to have an economic activity of human action, it's going to start with sales. The front office is in sales. When that phone rings, they, when they pick up that phone, they need to be able to go 10, 20 minutes uninterrupted, not putting people on hold because someone else is calling, uh, not, well, um, can I call you back? i got to check out somebody. I mean... That, that's why we run our model, two receptionists for two hygienists, for two assistants, for one dentist. Two, 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 one. And the front office is sales. And they're like, okay, um, so how long did you go to your last dentist? You know, was it one year, 20 years? What did you like the most about them? What did you like the least? What would you change in their office today? What would you never change? What are you looking for? I mean, satisfaction equals the perception of what's happening minus what I expect, um, uh, what I'm getting. Satisfaction equals perception minus expectations. So what is this patient perception? Did you like your last dentist? Why? Well, he took my insurance, he had nitrous oxide, and you're sitting there thinking, you don't even have nitrous oxide. 
Uh, what do you like most about your dentist? Well, you know, he's open evenings and weekends, and you're open Monday through Thursday, 8 to 4. Um, you know, what are, the, what are you expecting to have done? Um, it's very different when a patient says, well, I know I need to get this tooth pulled and add it to my partial versus, oh, I know this tooth is going to need a root canal, and I know I'm going to need another root canal in the crown. I mean, you have to know what this human is doing, that you're just obsessed with collecting demographic information. What is your address, your social security number, your insurance number, uh, yada, yada, yada. I mean, it's relationship, and the door starts your best people. I mean, if you have a basketball team, uh, you want a seven-foot center. Uh, with the exception of Michael Jordan. Uh, if you're a hockey team, you want a goalie. A soccer team, you want a goalie. Um, if you're a football team, you want a quarterback. I mean, every sport knows who their star franchise player is. And in dentistry, it is your receptionist. When they call your office, that's who answers the phone. Uh, when they come in the office, that's the first person they see. When they leave the office, that's why what we do with our front office, we move everything that we know it's, has to be done to the back. That way they can add time to operational logistics, get it done. That way, we free up our front office for sales and marketing to answer the phone. Thank you for calling today's dental. How may I help you? Um, look at your own hygiene and recall update. I mean, uh, if a hygienist works 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, that's 2,000 hours. If they see a person for an hour or twice a year, that means 2,000 hours. You could see 1,000 people for an hour cleaning exam uh, every six months. So when you got 5,000 charts, you should have five full-time hygienist going 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year. And you got 5,000 charts and you have one hygienist. 80% of your patients are not even on recall. And do you know why? And then when these people leave, do you have a customer satisfaction survey? Each appointment, you just had a root canal built on the ground. How would, you, how would you rate this from a one to five? Five being metaphysically perfect and one being this is a disaster. And you need to nail this today. Um, you need to have goals. You need to have measurements. In fact, Management, I think, is a word um, that really shouldn't even be called management because I, I don't know what that really means, but it should just be measurements. If you can measure it, you can manage it. Without measurements, there's no management. So the science of management should just be called measurements. And, uh, of course, I'm biased to math because I still believe that math is the fundamental of all intelligence and applied math is physics. Applied physics is, is um, chemistry. Applied chemistry is biology. Applied biology is medicine, psyche, psyche. Um, environmentalism and all of this has to be practiced as Adam Smith said <clears throat> the first economist the wealth of nations <coughs> which I find this um when I think about Adam Smith it gives me goosebumps because Adam Smith wrote the first economic treaties in 1776 a 32 year old Scott while at the same time another 32 year old Scott uh, wrote the Declaration of Independence Jefferson and here's a two 32 year old boys that basically made America because basically the reason the United States with only 280 million people out of 6 billion 400 million we only have 5% of the world's population but in a 40 trillion dollar economy and we had 11 trillion in 2004 we have one we have one out of 20 earthlings yet they have 27 cents of every dollar and why because the United States was the first place where free people collided with free markets, where 32-year-old Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations collided with Thomas Jefferson's free people. And free people collided with free economics, and it was a thermonuclear economic explosion that a quarter of a millennium later is still keeping us 200 times above the mean average of the bottom uh, 20 percentile. And Adam Smith said free trade, free markets, free men and women, create stronger economies and better lives. Know your mission. I mean, if you're a tree, let's spend the first five tapes exploring our roots. Then we'll get to the trunk. And then when you get up to these very peripheral decisions, they will be so clear to you because you have such a strong foundation. But when you don't have a f strong foundation, um, you're like Clinton who on camera live would just flip flop from one position to the other and you're like, good Lord, you're the president of the freest world's most powerful country and you're flip flopping daily. Every time he did an interview, he'd flip flop on national television. Whereas someone like Ronald Reagan, you couldn't shake him from his tree. I mean, he wanted less government, less taxes and a strong military and nobody could get him to budge an inch. Clinton, my gosh, he'd stick his finger in the air and he'd flip flop any time. So think about what Adam Smith said. And if you think reading the Bible is tough, you ought to read these guys in 1776. The Heritage Foundation 
has a free trade index of the 20 best countries, the 20 worst. Look at Hong Kong. Hong Kong is, I love to focus on Hong Kong because it's exactly the opposite of one of the biggest hot spots in the world, Israel. Hong Kong was 6 million people. Israel's about 6 million. And uh, 4 million Jewish, 2 million Palestinian. And Hong Kong, they came from all diverse religions and ethnic languages. But since they sat there and focused on free enterprise, everybody made so much money that no one cared that their neighbor had a different religion and different language. Israel, same type of demographics, different people all around the world. Jewish people were coming from, you know, Yiddish from Russia. They were coming from every corner of the world. But they practiced on socialism. And they're basically a big welfare state to rich Jewish people around the world donating money. And Milton Friedman, who is Jewish and is my favorite economist of all time, said, if Israel would have focused on free enterprise and capitalism, it wouldn't even be a hotbed today. And see, everybody's up in the trees trying to negotiate uh, what to do with the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and all these intricate details in the trees because they've lost sight of the foundation that when people focus first on capitalism and making money, when everybody's making money and having babies and raising their youngs and, and all the things that parents are caught up in and dinner and school and buying the iPod and all that stuff, no one cares that their neighbor's Buddhist or Hindu or Swahili. Or, it just doesn't matter. And Hong Kong is my favorite country because if you've ever gone to Hong Kong, these people came from every corner of China, every dialect, different religions, everything from around the world, Philippines, Indonesia, you name it, they're there. And everybody's so busy working that no one carries a gun, no one fights, there's no suicide bombers. Um, Singapore, unbelievable. Here's Singapore right next to um, the country, uh, what's the country right above Singapore? Uh, this is what happens when you're 43, you go blank on live television. And uh, you know, Singapore you know, is next to a country where average wealth is under $400 a year, um, just completely just pathetic economics. And one man had a vision for Singapore, and he said, um, "You spit out your gum on the deal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna arrest you, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna spank you. They have the three lashes. Um, you're not gonna spit out your gum. You're gonna go to school. And here's the school hours, and the school hours were extensive. And he said, "This is what we're gonna do." And he made another Hong Kong just by focusing on capitalism. Once again, Singapore, no one cares what religion you are. No one knows where they don't care where you're from. Um, tell them you're from the United States or that no one cares. They're all busy going to work. They're all busy cashing their paycheck. They're all busy buying stuff. Um, Luxembourg, um, Estonia, Ireland. Look at Ireland. Very apathetic. What do they do? Ireland, they lowered their taxes. They lowered corporate tax, incomes, intel, manufacturers from around the world. Ireland's had the highest growth rate in all of Europe in the last five years. Why? Because they're not getting caught up in the trees where no one understands what's going on. They said, let's focus on capitalism. Let's lower our taxes. Let's make it easier for business to come in here. Let's make it easier for people to do trade. Um, New Zealand, United Kingdom, Denmark, Iceland, Australia, Chile, Switzerland. The United States is the 13th. I mean, look at healthcare. I'm a dentist in Arizona. I can't even practice in New Mexico. Now, how stupid is that? All this regulation and red tape, and, uh, you know, it's a nightmare, but at least we're 13 out of 211. Then Sweden, Finland, Canada, Netherlands, Germany, Australia, Bahrain. Now look at the, 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 the 10 worst. North Korea, Burma, Libya, Zimbabwe, Turkmenistan, Laos, Cuba, Iran, Uzbekistan, Venezuela. What do these people do? They make it impossible to be free. And when you can't be free, you don't have free trade. When you don't have free people and you don't have free unregulated markets, you have mass poverty, you have suicides, you have war, you have turmoil, and it's, it's not about going in and negotiating something with Fidel Castro. It's about asking why this cockroach has survived 10 U.S. presidencies since Eisenhower. This guy should have been lynched from a tree, you know, 50 years ago, um, not dealing with North Korea, Libya, Zimbabwe, Cuba, Iran, Uzbekistan, it creates poverty. It means people are going to lose their teeth. It means there's not going to be wealth. So stick with the basics. Um, Nationmaster.com is an awesome website. It has the country's the highest and lowest gross national product per capita in U.S. dollars. Um, Luxembourg is the richest, but then again, Luxembourg has less people than the city of Tempe, Arizona. And you've probably never even heard of Tempe, Arizona. Um, but look at the United States, uh, averaging $35,000 per person.
By the way, when we say per capita, a lot of people think capita comes from capital, which comes from head. And that's a, that's a modern interpretation. Go ask a lot of people um, where capital comes from. They say, well, Latin, capita, head. But <laughs> Latin was only 2,000 years ago. You gotta go back to the earlier languages before that, um, Hebrew and, uh, and beyond. And capital, head, it actually came from a head of cattle. And cattle was that fungible wealth. I could take a cow into town and trade him for four pigs. I could trade five cows for your daughter. I could move my capital, my head of cattle around. So per capita, um, the capital of the United States originates from the word cattle head. So um, per head, uh, Bermuda. How can Bermuda get $34,000 a year per person, yet India can't? And wouldn't you think that India with a billion people at stake would say, my gosh, let's go to um, San Marino or Norway or Switzerland or um, why don't we just go see what these people did? And it's so easy. Look at India today, one of the poorest countries in the world. And they have a 60% import tax on anything coming in. So I want to go over there with these big machines so that people can be more productive since they're so poor and I can't bring my big machines in. I mean, just the people are just... Poverty is planned, poverty is executed, poverty is created by bad decision making versus the countries the lowest GDP, East Timor 400, Sierra Leone 492, Burundi 516, Somalia 532. And look at the hotbed problems we've had in Somalia. And uh, you remember the Clinton fiasco where they sent troops in and they asked for armored personnel and Clinton wouldn't give them to them and then you had all that bloodshed. And today it's a hotbed of uh, radical extremism. Well, you know what? As uh, Janis Joplin said, when you got nothing to lose, when you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. And by not addressing Somalia's poverty at $532 per person, then up in the roots you have uh, religious fundamentalism. And you're not going to go talk to a bunch of religious fundamentalists and get them to agree on doing something different. You kind of have to go to the roots and turn an, uh, Palestine, Israel into a Hong Kong, Singapore. And when you turn the Middle East into a Hong Kong and a Singapore, you'll be surprised at how fast people will quit listening to religious extremism and start listening to an iPod, uh, which is much more fun. Um, isn't it amazing that General Motors has more sales than the total combined GDP of Thailand and Norway? Ford Motor is larger than Saudi Arabia's total GDP? In fact, you take the 22 exporting oil companies of the world today and subtract oil, the remaining GDP of 22 countries is less than the size of Spain. These people, I mean, they're just extractionists. They're just extracting oil. They're not creating wealth. Mitsubishi is larger than Poland and South Africa. Royal Dutch Shell is larger than Greece. Exxon, Toyota, Walmart, they're larger in sales than Malaysia, Israel, Colombia, Venezuela, Philippines. It's about creating wealth. Um, Nokia or Nokia, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, I've been there, um, but Nokia or Nokia, um, its sales, its company's total outstanding uh, stocks times share price is larger than Finland's GDP. I mean, can you imagine that? Finland has one company that's worth more than its entire GDP. Um, when people say we spend too much money on economics, well, they don't have a clarity test. So let me give you a clarity on healthcare. Do we spend too much on healthcare? Well, Milton Friedman, I sent a letter to Milton Friedman, couldn't believe he answered it. He said, you have to have a clarity test. He said, here's your clarity test. You die tonight or you die a year from tonight. You take this blue pill and die a year from tonight or you die tonight. Now, how much would you spend that blue pill? And you say, well, I'll give you a hundred bucks. hundred bucks and you die tonight? What if I want a thousand? Would you pay me a thousand, die tonight? Or pay me a thousand dollars, take a blue pill and die a year from tonight? I mean, that's your only option, A or B. Die tonight or buy this pill and die a year from tonight. How much would you pay for that little blue pill? When you sit there and say, oh, health care, it's all up to the individual. You know, that's up to their own. It has nothing to do with me. I mean, everybody fends themselves. Okay, well, here's a clarity test. Uh, you're walking down the street and someone leaves a little baby there, wrapped in swollen clothes right there on the sidewalk. You say, die, baby. It's live and let die and survival of the fittest and you ain't fit because your mama dropped you off and die. Or you pick it up and say, hey, someone's going to deal with this baby. So the Mayo brothers found out, you know, 100 years ago, that people spend 50% of their lifetime budget on health care the last two weeks of their life. Because when they're going down, 
They don't care about their house, their car, and all that stuff. They, they want to save their life. They're in the intensive care, billing up a thousand bucks an hour. And so when you spend half of your lifetime supply of money in the last two weeks, and you'll pay almost everything you've got for a little blue pill to live one extra year, and when everybody says, like in Arizona, they just passed a law with, after a couple of babies were thrown in trash cans, they passed a law right here in Arizona that says, if you're going to throw away your baby, you don't want it, take it to a fire station. They will accept it and, they, and no, no strings attached. Just please give it to a fireman. So the United States, the richest country in the world, I'm proud to say, actually spends the most of its GDP on health care. It's over 15%. And all these countries spending 10 and 7 and 9 and 8 and 4 that say we spend too much cannot even pass a simple clarity test on how much they would pay for that little blue pill and would they leave that baby laying on the sidewalk. So um, United, Germany is the largest exporter, United States is second, and United States is the largest importer at a billion three to Germany being number two. So we got here from the right ethics, the right morality, the right virtues. Let's try to understand them more so you can make more virtuous decisions. Thank you. The virtue, industria, industriousness. This one is near and dear to Howard. People always want to know what's the magic bullet to success, but the bottom line is hard work and conscientious productivity create wealth for everyone, and the number of hours per week you work drastically affects your net income. Howard, the master of industriousness. Thank you, sweetness. Back to economics. <coughs> if you said you wanted to double the world's wealth, that'd be a very virtuous thought. You'd, you know. Well, what would you do? Um, if you just opened up a printing press and printed a million dollars for each 6.4 billion people, if all 6.4 billion people had another million dollars, all that would do is take a gallon of milk from $2 a gallon to $200,000 a gallon. It wouldn't change a thing. You'd still have the same number of people, same number of cows, same number of gallons of milk. Then you gave everybody more piece of paper that just bit up the price of everything. When the government prints more paper, it's simply called inflation. Um, you don't have inflation from any other fact than the government printing more money. Okay, that's all it is. But if you really wanted to double the wealth of the world, what would you do? Simplify it. Go back to Gilligan's Island. I mean, if the whole world was simply made up of people where everybody in the world got up and they made one donut per day, and they went to market and they all traded donuts all day, that was the whole industry. The only way you could double the wealth is if you could double every person's productivity so that everybody got up and made two donuts a day. Um, say you, everybody had a chicken that laid one egg a day. If you get the chicken to lay two eggs a day, you double the wealth of everyone. What is wealth? I mean, well, wealth is simply stuff or services. I mean, you can make me a sandwich or cut my hair. You know, it's a, it's a do my nails or give me a tire. It's services and stuff. And a lot of people are all paranoid because a lot of the people that make stuff is moving to third world countries and America is being a land of services. Well, just because those people don't understand economics is no reason to fear. Um, rich people make more money doing services than making stuff. Uh, do you want to go out and pick grapefruit or do you want to be a, uh, a film producer or a graphic artist or a computer programmer? Um, services are um, very profitable. Um, the number of hours you work, doctor, drastically affects your net income. It just blows my mind how a doctor will call me up all stressed out and I'll say, why are you so stressed out? And he's like, well, I'm going through a third divorce and I'm thinking, what's that about? And, uh, and he's saying, you know, I'm putting three th kids through college, paying their way. And I'm like, well, did your dad pay your way? Oh no, I had to put myself through college. Okay, so that's why your kids are up in college, ASU, smoking pot and not giving a crap what their GPA is. Uh, they're not even uh, ventured, they, they don't even have risk capital of their own at stake. And then I go back, doctor, okay, you're paying for your third divorce. You're paying for three kids to go through college. Uh, what's the problem? Oh, my income's down. And I'll say, first question, well, how many hours a week do you work? Oh, I work Monday through Thursday, 8 to 4. I'm like, doc, that's not even a job. That's not even a full-time job. I mean, that's a part-time job that doesn't even offer benefits at Walmart. Um, why, does, why do the 750,000 physicians have a culture where they average 60 hours per week and make $5,000 a year less than the average dentist who makes $5,000 more than the average physician per year 
and does it on 32 hours a week. And can you imagine what a freak I would look like if I was a dental consultant and I was going around saying, well, hey, doc, just work six 10-hour days. They look at me like, what are you, a fruitcake? What are you, crazy? How come the 750,000 physicians can do 60 hours a week and the 140,000 dentists can only do 32 hours a week? I mean, the average dentist works half the hours of the average physician and makes 5,000 bucks a year more. I mean, it's simply crazy how you don't work. And um, even the ADA's got good math on this. On the ADA survey dental practice 2002, dentists who work 32 hours or more a week average 150,000 a year, and the people who are less than 32 do 114,000 a year. Um, I can tell you after seeing doctors, numbers, balance sheets, statement of cash flows, P&Ls, tax returns for 20 years, and having a whole bunch of uh, consultant friends in the industry um, where we compare notes and things like that. Um, when you see dentists taking home 500, 600,000 a year, um, they're usually working 50, 55 hours a week, and they only have to do that for a few short years and pack away a lot of money. But there seems to be this huge number of dentists who believe that graduating with a dental degree means that you get three-day weekends. And you know what the danger of a three-day weekend is? Friday, you sleep in and relax and maybe read a book. Saturday, maybe do some chores around the house, some yard work, whatever. Sunday, you're so gosh darn bored out of your mind that you go to Home Depot and start a $3,000 remodeling your bathroom project. And when idle hands just spend money. And then it gets to be that you don't even feel productive on your day off unless you go spend a bunch of money and do some big project to be productive. And instead of spending a lot of money being productive, you ought to go back to your office and work and earn a lot of money. When we talk about portraits of a millionaire, the median income, and this was a fantastic book, The Millionaire Next Door, um, Thomas Stanley and William Danko back in 96, and it's still a classic. The median income of a millionaire in America is only 131000 per year. It's not what you make, it's what you spend. Um, my understanding of dentists, and maybe it's because I see most of the dentists are in trouble, but the common scenario with all people is they live paycheck to paycheck because no matter what they make, they spend. Even when the wife um, decides they don't want to stay with the kids and they want to go uh, in the, and work, 60% of women do. Uh, now they got to buy an extra car, an extra wardrobe, an extra insurance. I mean, it doesn't matter what you earn. It simply matters what you spend, what you save. Um, millionaires live in homes currently valued at an average of only $300,000 a year, yet they're a millionaire. About 80% of millionaires are first generation, which means they didn't influence, they're not daddy did it, so they didn't get here with some Ivy League school where dad, dad uh, wrote a letter and got him in. And, uh, but here's interesting, two thirds of millionaires work between 45 and 55 hours per week. When I opened my dental office, now granted, I, lots of people would call me crazy, but I worked from seven in the morning to seven at night, Monday through Saturday for the first several years. I graduated $86,000 of student loans. Uh, Sweetie bought a house for 150, took us about $150,000 uh, loan to start a dental office back in 87, and we worked seven to seven, Monday through Saturday, and paid off everything in three years. And I mean, we were doing, we were doing six, 12 hour days. Uh, what is six times 12? Uh, 72 hours a week. And in three years, you don't have student loans. You don't have a mortgage on your house. Uh, your office is paid off. There are three and a half million households in America like Judith and ours. And it didn't come from the Lucky Sperm Club. We didn't inherit it. I wasn't born on a, on a country club. Um, you know, I think anybody that saw where I came from would say some kind of some form of Kansas trailer trash, and it's just the bust hard work. I can still remember Judith and I, we did that for three and a half years, then we cut back and decided to make Eric, Greg, Ryan, and Zach, and um, we got out of school at 24, we started the family at 27, but those, uh, those three years, we used to sometimes go to a restaurant, kick up our feet, and we were so exhausted, we had a hard time even looking at the menu, it was like, oh God, and then we just eat and go to sleep, and it was fun, it was fun, we were young, um, but you can't, lazily lean forward and turn out a bunch of productivity. You gotta work. And um, let's review, why do specialists make so much more money than general dentists? Um, average general dentist makes, uh, grosses uh, 543,000 a year. Uh, basically half a million a year specialists are three quarters of a million. Um, the average dentist grosses uh, 45,000 a month. The average specialist is 65,000 a month. Uh, net income per year is 150 for 
the dentist, and two thirty for the specialist. Uh, net income per month: twelve thousand five hundred for a general dentist, twenty thousand for a specialist. And overhead is sixty-two percent for general dentist, fifty-five percent for specialist. What is it with specialist? Um, you tell me. Well, specialists don't have a lab bill. Well, orthodontists have a huge lab bill. Um, you tell me it's um, because they do one thing over and over and over, and you know you do one thing over and over. You basically do fillings and crowns. Uh, they do wisdom teeth and implants. I mean, you know, there's a huge variety between wisdom teeth and implants and surgeries and cysts and and uh, endodontist. Um, you know, they do a variety of procedures, not just root canals, but apicos, etc. But the real reason is specialists work more hours. Um, average general dentist has three chairs. Average specialist has five chairs. Um, you know, they they just simply work harder. Um, oral surgeons are taking emergencies from you. They're not going to go to lunch and tell one of the referring doctors, "Oh, I can't see your emergency today. Uh, you know, I can't see him till tomorrow or whatever." Um, endodontist has a hot tooth. They uh, they they work through lunch. They stay late. They they um, they see emergencies. Uh, I can tell you after 20 years the. Easiest way to explain why specialists make a quarter of a million more year in production and net an additional um, $80,000 a year is simply, they just simply work harder. And if I could define a average dentist work ethic in America for the average, I don't know how you could say it any other way than just either just spoiled, spoiled rotten. They say, well, I make $150,000 a year. I don't really have a full-time job. I only work 32 hours a week. I have a three-day weekend. I'm just lazy. And uh, you're lazy because you can make $150,000 a year by being lazy. But uh, I, don't, I just don't think it's virtuous to be lazy. I think it's virtuous to be industrious. Um, here's 17,000 new patients. 5.5% um, came in for an abscess swelling. Another 15% came in uh, with a broken tooth. 2% uh, of denture problem, less than 2% of gum problem, 17% um, of toothache, 3% um, had a wisdom tooth. Now, there, let's just stop right there, a wisdom tooth. I mean, you're pull, three out of 100 people call a dental office because they got pericornitis around the erupting wisdom tooth, and uh, you know, you're removing a little 20 millimeter enamel pearl. Um, it doesn't move, there's no moving parts. The whole game is basically there's just two nerves. There's the inferior alveolar and the lingual nerve. And you can remove bone mesial and buccal. You just can't remove bone distal and lingual, or you hit the lingual uh, feed of the tongue and go too far apical and you hit the inferior alveolar nerve. Um, it's an easy procedure. And they're two fifty dollars a piece, a thousand bucks. No lab bill. All you got is you know, four or five carps of septicane and some reusable pliers and elevators. I mean, just, just easy work. And yet 80% of the dentists won't do them. And I'll say, why, why can't you pull wisdom teeth? Well, I don't like blood. Okay, you don't like blood. What were you thinking going to dental school? I mean, did you think if you cut open a human, you'd see a bunch of chips? Uh, did you think you'd be a hard drive and a ram? I mean, how does going to dental school and not like blood, I mean, what the hell were you thinking? I mean, I, I, I can't fathom that. Maybe you're just in a comfort zone making $150,000 a year and you just don't want to push yourself and it's some procedure you're not familiar with. And yes, the first hundred impacted wisdom teeth you pull will be hard. Um, some of them will be impossible. Some you only get halfway and have to refer to an oral surgeon. Um, but the next hundred will get easier. And I pretty much pulled 99% of all my wisdom teeth for the last 20 years. And now it's just, I mean, it, that's my golf. You go spend Friday playing golf. Um, I spend Friday pulling wisdom teeth. And you pay $300 to go play around a golf and waste six hours. And I sit there and get $1,000 a set of wisdom teeth, and it's just nothing but net, um, but you just don't want to work hard. I mean, are you really going to go your entire 40-year dental career and say, nope, never went to a third world nation, did charity dentistry. Never uh, did one case of orthodontics, not even, not, did, not even my own children. Never pulled a set of wisdom teeth, not, not even my own children. Uh, never even placed one implant. Not one single root form implant, just one. And, and I'm just sitting here telling you that, you know, I tell dentists they have the Saddam Hussein syndrome. Saddam Hussein surrounded himself with people that told him exactly what he wanted to hear. And if you told him what he didn't want to hear, he'd kill you. So, you know, the night before he fought the Americans twice, you know, all of his uh, guards were saying, oh, you're going to kick their butt, you're going to kick their butt. And each of these wars uh, were just uh, massive, uh, massive losses for the Iraqis. I mean, they lost 100,000 um, during the first stages of the war with the United States both times. And you got to be asking, you know, what was this guy thinking to go lay 100,000 of his men down and die and lose twice? 
And the bottom line is that's with your staff. Um, your staff will tell me, can you tell the doctor about his impressions? You know, he, he, he'll take impressions or bubbles. He didn't capture the margin. He sends it in. Then he gets it back from the lab and, and then it doesn't fit. Then he gets mad at the lab and he changes labs and he's gone through like five labs last year. And I'll say, why don't you go tell him? And they'll say, oh, are you kidding? He'll fire me. You can't tell the dentist something they don't want to hear. Well, that's what I'm here today for. You know, I don't want to be your friend. Please, I'm not looking for a friend. Uh, don't send me a letter on my birthday. I'm not going to call you on your birthday. I'm going to tell you exactly the truth. And most of the lecture circuit, you know, the, all they, their only goal is to be reinvited to speak again. My goal when I get done lecturing you is to have you so upset that you'll never invite me to lecture back. And that's okay because the world's big and I lecture too much as it is. Bottom line is you're lazy. Um, to not be able to place a single root form implant in an entire dental career, I mean, I, I don't know how, I mean, it's apathy, lazy, dumb, ignorant. I mean, why, why do you not push out? Orthodontics, it's glue and rubber bands. What do you not understand? Is it the glue or the rubber band? Um, orthodontics, orthodontics don't even do orthodontics. The assistants do it all. I mean, they just walk around, check, 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 check. It's glue and rubber bands, and you've never done one case. I mean, I don't understand, and your stat, and then you tell me you need more patients. Yeah, you just want more patients that want their teeth filed down for a crown because it's easy and mindless, and you're so good at it because, you know, all you do is take two millimeters off top, round, round, round. You go to 25 courses to find out if you should go round, round this way or round, round that way. It just blows my mind when you raise your hand and say, well, which burr do you use? God for sakes, use any burr, okay? Uh, this year, only use round burrs. Next year, cylinders. Next year, diamonds. I mean, I mean. I mean, it's just so, so mind-numbing. And then you ask me, that, and you tell me and complain. You say, well, what do you do for burnout? Well, burnout, I mean, you're just doing a few little tasks. Um, you won't do molar endo. You won't pull wisdom teeth. You won't do orthodontics. You won't place one implant. I mean, push yourself. Push yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, give your assistant full veto power over your crown and bridge impressions. You know, shoot the impression. Go do a hygiene check. Let your assistant pull it out and read. That's what we do at our office. And they don't come to me and show me the impression. They come to me and say, we need to reshoot another one, or it's good. It's good. Do you want to see it? And, you know, Jan's been with me 17 years. I don't have to backseat driver all day long. Uh, but if Jan says good, I know it's good. And she's younger than I am. She's probably got better eyesight than I am. And she says, Doc, we need to reshoot. I don't say give me the impression. If I can't even sell Jan on the impression, who's standing in the room with the patient live, how am I going to convince a Crown and Bridge lab uh, the next state over? And, uh, and when someone comes in with wisdom tooth, why do you have your patients call you a doctor if you can't even lay a flap and administer some anesthetic and surgically remove a wisdom tooth? If you can't do that, I don't even know how you really claim you're a doctor. Uh, push yourself. Get out of the comfort zone. Um, commit today, right now. Commit that you're going to pick up something you've never done. Maybe ortho. Maybe molar endo. Uh, maybe implants. Maybe wisdom teeth. And you know, you, you know there's 24,000 towns and villages in the United States. And half of them, 12,000 towns, villages in the United States have not one specialist. They don't have one of the nine specialties recommended by the ADA. And when you say, I can't do that, they're going to have to drive 100 miles in town. And you're forcing them to say, well, you know, I don't want to drive in town to Uruk and I'm going to pull the tooth. Well, he can't do an implant, so I don't want to drive him to the big city. A lot of people in the farm towns, they don't like to go in the big city. So they're going to go with the denture removal. All because you can't get off the couch, put down your golf clubs on Friday, go to a continued education course, or the best online CE, or the best continued education is online for free on dentaltown.com, on hygienetown.com. Uh, we don't charge anything for online CE. It's fantastic modules there. You'll see on the new patients that still the number one thing consumers want, 39%, is just a cleaning and a checkup. Yet you have only one hygienist and she's booked up six weeks in advance. And you have 5,000 charts. You know, add another hygienist. Increase your productivity. Increase the number of services you see, the number of patients you see, and that's the more productivity, the more wealth. Versus how many institutions say, tired of seeing 20 people a day, come to my place and we'll get it down to 10 people. Then the next institution next door is saying, oh no, come to my place, we only five people. And then the next one, oh no, come to my place, there's only one person, will file down all their teeth for crowns. I mean, it's just crazy. 7% um, want a cleaning only. Look at, the, look at the second opinion. Half percent, one in 200. People don't need a second opinion. They need an ATM machine. They need cash. They can't afford what you sell. Your prices are so high, they're getting a second opinion to see if there's another way to solve this problem that costs less money. Um, 
a complete exam in that interesting seven nine point seven percent or ten percent an amazing top um, Peter Dawson always go around saying you know uh, top ten percent and the only thing I didn't like about this deal is the way he framed it like the top ten percent was better than the bottom ninety I mean I have worked on the top ten percent I worked on the poorest ten percent I like the bottom ten percent more they're not anal they're not all tied up they pay their bills more look in your account receivables they're richer they are they drive a Mercedes Benz you know they're living on credit Rich, real rich people don't drive Mercedes Benz. Uh, they drive a Ford and a Chevy and they're million dollars in the bank. Person driving the Mercedes Benz is living on credit cards. Um, I live across the street from the Guadalupe Indian Reservation, 25,000 people. And they call them um, 5,000 legal Guadalupe Indians and 20,000 illegal aliens. And to explain what an alien is, basically when white people come from Europe and shoot Indians in the head, that's legal annexation. And then when they find uh, gold in California in 17 or in uh, 1849, and they send in the military and steal 40% of Mexico with a gun, they steal Texas, New Mexico, Phoenix, and California, where the cities are named Los Angeles, San Antonio, San Francisco. When they steal 40% of Mexico, that's legal annexation. Then when the poor Mexican comes up south of the border into Arizona, which used to be part of Mexico, now he's an illegal alien. And you know what, 20 years of practicing dentistry, I've never once been taken to the cleaners from someone not paying their bill from Guadalupe, not once. Yet there's another area next to me, the equestrian center, which is all million dollar homes. Oh my God, they just lie, cheat and steal, it's unbelievable. Uh, isn't it funny, the poor give more to charity and you don't have an AR account receivables wrong with them and the rich, they don't have any money for charity and they just walk around screwing their local dentist so they can drive a Mercedes Benz. Um, so, a complete exam is, uh, yeah, top 10% want it in wealth, but they're not the 10%, top 10% in uh, virtues, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and look at the cosmetic dentistry bleaching. It's not even 1%. 99% of all the attention is extreme makeovers. And, and, you, know, and you know, when I look at extreme makeovers, I, I see extreme pathology. When a woman wakes up in the morning and she needs uh, veneers, implants, tummy tucks, eye lifts, fake cheekbones, a fake chin, a facelift, you know, maybe she needs a psychiatrist. Maybe she needs a psychologist. Maybe someone needs to find out what went wrong with the little girl who looked in the mirror and saw something so ugly it needs 14 surgeries. And does she really need a healthcare community standing around like vultures? ready to take all of her cash and pump up her boobs with silicone and her lips with Botox. I was sitting in an airplane and this 50 year old lady sat down next to me. She had so much Botox in her upper lip that from a side view, she looked like Homer Simpson. And I'm sitting here thinking, what the heck went wrong with her mind to think that Homer Simpson is sexy? I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, stick to what the patients want. Um, early on this program, Let's do a lot of basic reviews. W. Edwards Deming is, a lot of people call him the father of modern management. And uh, Demings has 14 points of management. And you've heard them a hundred times, but this might be a good time to simply review them. Create constancy of purpose for the improvement of quality and service. Every day long, your staff, how do we constantly improve quality and service? And when people call, how long do they have to be on hold? Do you even measure that? Do you answer on the first ring or do you, they go to an answering machine and you call back? Um, do you track your remakes? Um, the big labs tell me the average remake for a big lab is 6%. Um, do you track it 6%? Um, do you have less remakes at 10 years out of school than you did five years out of school? Do you even know what your remake factor is? Do you count your reduction copings? I mean, look, look at a reduction coping. It simply means you took the final impression before you made the temporary. You know, when you make the temporary before, you take an impression of the final crown and you're adjusting the bite and you're adjusting it and adjusting it and adjusting it. You go through the, the temporary and then you look up and there's a huge plunger cusp and you didn't have enough reduction. Then you would throw the temporary away and make more reduction and smooth out the opposing plunger cusp. And you simply, your whole life, you have to take the impression and let the assistant make the temporary. And when the assistant makes a temporary, it takes 30 minutes. And you, when you make it with the assistant, it takes about three or four minutes. And when you make it with the assistant, when you're trimming the margin, you learn more about your margin. If you can't read on your temporary, do you think you're going to read on your final impression? And when you're sitting there adjusting the occlusion, if you don't have enough clearance for a piece of acrylic, do you really think you have enough clearance for metal, gold, and porcelain? So the bottom line is, 
you know, are you constantly measuring and managing improvement of quality dentistry and the service, the way your patients are uh, treated? Have you adopted this new philosophy? Um, cease dependence on mass inspections. I mean, when you go into your hygienist and she says a perio charting, do you really have to pick up a periodontal probe and go back and measure? I mean, if you have to go back and measure, I mean, why would the hygienist lie on the probe and she's either um, unskilled and just needs some more training or she's a pathological liar. I mean, just decide which it is, okay? Is she lying, is she insane, um, or does she need a little more training? But give up mass inspection. I mean, if you have to reprobe your hygienist, either you need to see a psychologist and a psychiatrist, either he or she, the hygienist, needs more training, but just cease dependence on this deal. We're not, it's just so belittling. Um, in the practice of buying from the cheapest supplier. I mean, that's the whole government. The reason, one of the, one of the main reasons the government's so screwed up is every time they do anything, they bid it out to the cheapest uh, supplier, and then you wonder why a little stretch of road took two, two years to build um, because, you know, it was so cheap. I mean, I mean, it's unbelievable. I live here in Phoenix, Arizona. They were building a freeway about 10 miles long um, from north to south Scottsdale, and that was the government, and that took about 10 years. And then some multimillionaire guy who owned the Phoenix Suns decided he was going to build a baseball stadium with a retractable roof. He builds this whole thing in a year. And in the year, the government couldn't build one mile of interstate. And it's a flat piece of concrete, just a flat highway. And the other guy's got a retractable roof on a stadium that holds 45,000 people. I mean, um, just cease dependence on the cheapest supplier. You know, if you're giving... Uh, Patterson or Shine or Burkhart or Benco, um, a chunk of change each month. Uh, let's build a relationship. You know, that rep coming in the office, um, that rep is interacting with 50 offices and they start seeing patterns of the ones that do this do better at this. Um, the people who do their endo an hour and love endo, they all have Apex locators and digital x rays and root ZXs and 300 RPM NITIs, K3s, profiles, and the people who hate endo. Um, you know, or with a PA and they're film dipping it from the developer and they don't have apex locators and they're hand filing everything. I mean, you know, don't buy on price, buy on a very rich and valuable relationship. Um, suppliers uh, are part of your value chain. Um, same thing with relationships with your insurance companies. We don't get a bunch of problems from our insurance companies because I have my staff go have lunch with the local Delta people, the local Blue Cross and Blue Shield people, uh, Fordis Insurance. I want relationships. I mean, if we're calling our insurance company and they're giving us a half million dollars a year and we couldn't pick their people out of a police lineup, how dysfunctional is that? When I opened my office the first several years, I used to have the head of Delta Dental come out to the house, we'd cook him dinner, we'd go to a restaurant. I wanted to work the value chain. It wasn't just buying for cheap. Um, improve constantly and forever the system of production and service. Um, just keep training and retraining. Um, institute leadership. Uh, drive out fear. You know, in my office, you know, it's not Dr. Ferrand. I'm back in my office and I always shut the door. My, I have an open door policy. Um, and my staff in the front office, when people send me mail, they open up all the mail. If you were a letter to me that said personal, only for Dr. Ferran, they would open up and decide whether I should read or not by being transparent. Look at transparency. The United States has 25,000 nuclear bombs and no one cares because they all watch C-SPAN and know we're incompetent. We can't even take out Fidel Castro and he's 90 miles off for a shore communist who survived 10 U.S. presidencies. But look at North Korea. Pyong, they may have one, zero, six nuclear bombs and the whole world's all freaking out because you don't know what North Korea is doing. They're not transparent. You know what the United States is doing. Heck, the Congress is live on C-SPAN. Everybody knows what kind of a uh, nut we are. We're completely transparent. Our press is given free reign. The press can go up to the president of the United States and says, hey, what you said isn't true or you said this and you're not doing that or you campaign on this and your own staff is afraid of you like Saddam Hussein. Your staff can't even walk up to you and say, Doc, I think you should reshoot this impression. And then you're calling me wanting to build a bigger office and you have fear in your office? My gosh, my, I, I live a transparent life for my staff. Um, health problems, medical problems, uh, it doesn't matter. I am an open book because I want to surround myself with people that I love and respect and I hope that they can help me and I hope I can help them and that's the, um, that's the fundamental foundation of everyone growing the pie. Um, they, some call me Howard, some call me Howie, some call me Doc. Jan calls me the great one. I like her the most. She, she floats my ego. 
Uh, but drive down the barriers between staff areas. I mean, just drive them down. Uh, one of the craziest ways we drove down staff barriers was just the simple Motorola walkie-talkies. It was unbelievable. When the front office was here, the hygienists were over here, and the assistants were here, they always spoke in language them versus us versus them. You know, the front office didn't do that. The back office didn't say, wait, we don't have a back office. We have people. We have 12 people. Why do you call them the front office? You know, their names are Sandy and Dawn and Kim and Chris. And why do you say the hygienist? Whatever happened to Janet and Christine and Corey and Kim? And why do you say the assistants always do this? What happened to Jan and Colleen and Christine and Amy? And, well, the reason it was that way is because they had geographical barriers. It's like you notice all around the world, if there's a big mountain range or a river, you have different languages on each side of the river, each side of the mountain range, just different dialects. So by putting them on Motorola walkie-talkies every day, we start the day with a team huddle, just like they would before the Super Bowl. No one would go into the Super Bowl game without a morning meeting or a morning sales huddle or a morning plan. We start the day with a morning huddle. And then everybody puts on their walkie-talkies, and now the front, now it's all us. It's like, hey, you guys, we just got a cancellation at 9 in hygiene in room 2 with Christine. Can anybody fill it? And then <laughs> two minutes later, the assistant's asking an emergency patient who just got a, a, a broken tooth filled with a filling, saying, by the way, we just got opening our hygiene department. Would you like to get your teeth clean? Breaking down those barriers was pro with Motorola walkie-talkies was probably the number one thing we did to increase our productivity in the last two years. As cheesy as that sounds, 69 bucks a piece. Um, eliminate slogans and exhortations and targets for the workplace. Like I hear people come in and say, well, we want 30% of our new patients to have root plane curatage. Well, shouldn't the only people that get root plane curatage be the ones with gum disease? What if no one has gum disease? Do we still want 30 for, forget all these stupid endless, so you're a doctor. You can't say we want to increase our breast cancer surgeries on 29%. I mean, you know, I mean, that's just absurd. Um, eliminate numerical quotas. I mean, don't tell people they have to do all these things. I mean, try to all work together uh, remove barriers to pride of workmanship. Um, let people have their institutions. Um, institute a vigorous program of education and retraining. That's why in Dental Town, Hygiene Town, we did online CE modules. I know it's expensive to close down dental office for a day. I know it's hard to recoup your investment. This is why I'm making a training on DVD for money. This is why we make them on our websites for free. Um, take action to accomplish transformation. Don't talk, talk, talk. Get things implemented. Um, Peter Drucker is another infamous uh, business leader. And um, Peter Drucker um, and Deming are one of the greatest. Um, Peter Drucker says, do not worship high profit margins and premium pricing. Isn't it interesting that everyone who lowered their costs the most, thus lowered their price the most, made the most money. Southwest Airlines makes more net income than anyone else in the airline industry and they have the lowest prices. Um, Walmart makes a straight 12.5% on anything they sell, and they make more profit than everyone else who marks up everything 45%, 50%. I find it absurd when Walmart goes into a small town. <clears throat> Here's all these people buying um, shoes and clothes and apparel and marking it up 100 to 200%, and everyone cries when Walmart comes and puts them all out of business. And yet the same people that are all crying and bawling um, all want more money. Uh, they all want their boss to get more money. They want the government to do less taxes. I mean, everyone has to drive down cost and increase productivity to make everyone more wealthy. And Home Depot did it to the home improvement industry. Walmart did it to, uh, um, you know, Walmart is now 1% of China's GDP. Do not use cost of what it costs me to do this crown and then adding profit to arrive at a price. That's exactly backwards. You start with the price, subtract the profit you need, now arrive at a budget. You know, look at all the other surgeries, like, like take veneers. Uh, you'll say a veneer. Well, how much are veneers? Well, they're six fifty a tooth. Really? So if you do six, eight, or ten, it's six fifty a tooth? Oh, yeah. And you'll say, okay, well, six fifty a tooth times ten, that's six thousand five hundred. A facelift is forty nine fifty. A boob job is thirty five hundred. A tummy tuck is twenty nine fifty. You really think ten upper teeth? in the marketplace is worth more than a facelift, a boob job, or a tummy tuck? Why do you do cost plus property plus price? There is a price where people will get a facelift, a boob job, and a tummy tuck, okay? And once you go over that price, you lose most of the market. So if the most expensive thing on the market is a $5,000 facelift, you shouldn't be charging $7,000 for upper 10 veneers, and then wonder why you only do a case every month or two 
yet there are surgeons in town who do facelifts one every morning, one every afternoon, five days a week. They do 10 faces a week, 50 weeks a year, and you do veneers once a quarter because you do cost plus profit equals price instead of price minus profit equals budget. And tell me, once you see the patient in a chair, once you numb them up, one, does it cost any more money to, num to prep four teeth or six teeth versus two teeth or three teeth? I mean, come on. Once they're all numb, the actual prepping time, seating time, and if you follow the infamous genius Robert Ibsen, the founder of cosmetic dentistry, wrote the first book on aesthetic dentistry with his permanent whitening, no prep lumineers with serenade porcelain. Uh, I've been doing these. They come in, take an impression. You make them, they're the thickness of a contact lens. You glue them onto the front. The patients love them. There's no shots, no drilling, no prep. I mean, I put a case in a 40-year-old man uh, two weeks ago named Bruce, and he literally got teary-eyed and started to cry when he saw them. And, uh, and that's a man. And, you know, no prep. Um, you know how many dentists I personally know, and I'd love to name. They probably wouldn't even care if I name him. One's in San Jose. He knows exactly who he is. He's a famous lecturer. And he just, he just so regrets letting someone file down his teeth 10, 20 years ago and put on veneers. Since then, some had been replaced, some turned into crowns, some have died and need endo. He just wishes to heck he would have got the no prep, no reduction, no anesthetic um, Denmat lumineers with serenade porcelain. And think about that. Um, would you let your daughter file down her front 10 teeth? No, you'd make her do orthodontics and bleaching. Yet since you can't do orthodontics, you file down all your customer's teeth, knowing that you wouldn't do it on yourself or your daughter. And what did all the major religions say? What was the golden rule? Treat other people like you want to be treated. You wouldn't even do it on your own teeth, yet you do that on people's teeth. Um, you know, think of how you can restructure business. Do veneers with no prep. Learn ortho. Um, do not feed problems and starve opportunities. That is a classic in dentistry. They'll have an awesome hygiene department. They'll be wonderful at Crown and Bridge, um, but they're uh, you know but they're uh, they're horrible at TMD and they're taking 8,000 courses in TMDs and they're not paying attention to the thing that's working in their office. So you know if you got five departments and four of them are kicking butt, don't put all your time on the one department that's going down. Um, sometimes it just needs to go down. Sometimes you need to close it up. Um, how many business did Sears sell off Allstate? Um, how many uh, Chrysler used to have a condominium development company in Florida, they sold it off. Um, feed your opportunities and starve your problems. Um, Jack Welsh is my favorite CEO, he really is. He always says that people overestimate how complex business is. It isn't rocket science, it's one of the world's most simple professions. Most global businesses only have three or four critical competitors and you know who they are. You know who the three or four dentists are across the street that you actually compete with. Uh, there aren't many things you can do with a business. It's not as if you're choosing among 2,000 options. I mean, what is business? You make something, you sell something, you watch the numbers. And what do you manage? Time, people, and money. I mean, why do you learn how to do root canals? How can you understand the Krebs cycle and how many ATP come out of glucose? I mean, why do you know the periodic table? I mean, dentists are the only psychos on the planet that know the difference between a cosine and a tangent and are proud of it. I've always said dentists are people that uh, didn't have enough personality to become accountants. And, uh, you know, business is simple and you make it so hard. You make something, you sell something, you watch the numbers, you manage people, time and money. It's so simple. Uh, but, and, and once you start focusing on this, like you focus on a root canal, it's going to be easy. And to start it, I want you to start doing your own math. I mean, if I had my legs blown off in war, uh, I could get, I could farm out my legs to a wheelchair. Um, if I lost my uh, two eyes, I could farm it out to a CNI dog. Um, but if you lost your brain, um, it's pretty much over. And what do we say the fundamental of all intelligence? All intelligence, I mean, there was a continuum, math, religion. And math and religion are on two different sides of the railroad track going the same way. And religion is based on faith alone. There is no measurement. You just believe it or you don't. But over here, it's math. And one plus one equals two, and there's no debate on whether it equals three or four or nine. One plus one is two, and applied math is physics. Applied physics is chemistry, applied chemistry, biology, applied biology, dentistry, healthcare, the brain, and right here, math. You don't farm out all your math to an accountant. Accountants are historians. They just call you up when they say, hey doc, last month, I forgot to tell you, you went bankrupt. Yeah, you'll need to file chapter 11, here's the name of a good attorney. 
And when you call your accountant and ask them business decisions, I mean, that, that is just, you might as well call Dion Warwick uh, the psychic hotline. I mean, it'd probably be cheaper and easier than your accountant. And your accountant's getting reports from dry cleaners and Chinese restaurants and dentists and chiropractors and veterinarians and, and tanning salons. And you're asking them for advice. You live in your business. You can barely figure it out. And you think an accountant is going to master 300 different industries? When you ask an accountant for advice, that comes from, I mean, you might as well light a candle, uh, you know, sacrifice a goat. Uh, it's crazy. And you need to start with your own math. And if you don't measure it, you don't manage it. And I'll go up to a doc and I'll say, what do you run your office on? He'll say soft end by Kodak. And I'll say, how many reports does it run? Five, 10, 20, 50? How many? Oh, you know, I don't really know. And I'll say, well, you know, what, is, what was your overhead last month? You know, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have to look that number up. And uh, it's like, why? Do your own math. Peachtree, uh, Practice Outlook, Quicken, Microsoft Money. I mean, do your own math. You can't be a businessman. I mean, you make something, you're the dentist. Um, you sell something. That's your marketing. We'll talk about that later, but marketing is the product itself. You don't make a crappy iRiver and then try to sell a bunch of ads to sell it. Marketing is making a great iPod, and you know who sells it? All the little kids who own one. They tell all the other friends to get one. Um, look at Google. Google didn't have any ads during the Super Bowl to say, hey, we're a great search engine. Leave Yahoo, go to Google. Google spent all their time in building an awesome search engine. And you know who sold Google? All their happy customers. So you make something. You make it so darn good like Google or an iPod, it sells itself. You don't have to do interruption marketing with full page ads and TV ads and Super Bowl ads and radio ads. Your customers will sell it for you, word of mouth referral. And then you, you, sell, you make something, you sell something, you watch your numbers. You don't watch your numbers. You don't measure anything. I'll go in and say, um, you work on, with Dentrix. Uh, owned by Shine, or maybe it's Eaglesoft, owned by Patterson. I'll say, well, how many reports does it have? You can't even tell me. I'll say, which ones do you run each month? Uh, you don't even know, okay? You can't only read root canal journals and outsource your brain. Do your own math. Um, here's another one for review. Uh, Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits Highly Effective People. Now, be proactive. Take the initiative and the responsibility to make things happen. Don't say, I'm going to get more involved um, with... Um, my uh, account receivables and then don't. Um, don't go to staff meetings and just talk. Um, get each staff member an email and make this proactive exchange of communication 24 seven. You can be at home at 10 o'clock at night talking to your hygienist about you know what you think about this or the recare or how you're gonna do it and email them. And you might have spent an hour typing this out, rereading it, typos, do I really wanna say this? I wanna be positive, maybe your spouse will read it. You know, like your mom said when you write a letter, you know, don't mail it till the next day so you can read it one more time. Maybe you're a little upset after dinner thinking about what went wrong in your recare system, whatever. And you really take the time to do it right, but it's 24 seven. It's things you're doing over the weekend, things you're doing in the evening. You may send this to your staff and they might not even reply to it till the weekend. Um, begin with the end in mind. Start with a clear, destination to understand where you are now and where you're going and what you value the most. Try to get a picture of, you know, what are you looking for in an office? What are your goals? Have you communicated this to all your staff? Do your customers know what you're trying to accomplish? Put first things first. And I'm going to go into detail about managing yourself. Um, I see so many dentists. And I mean, when you think about this, think, think about this. In America, 1% are schizophrenic. It's pretty easy to diagnose schizophrenic. You're having visual hallucinations. I mean, when you have an auditory, everyone, healthy people have auditory hallucinations where they think someone called their name or they thought they heard their mom say, Howard, and you look and there's no one there. That's, that's normal. But a visual hallucination, that, that's, that's mental illness. 4% uh, are bipolar. 5% have ADD. 27% have depression. Dentistry is 88% males. And men have a very high depression rate in adolescence and around their 40 from you know, 38 to 45 with their testosterone drops. And then again, elderly, when men's testosterone goes to zero, um, they get a lot of depression. And I will see people and they will sum up what's wrong with their office. And I'm listening to their lips move and I'm listening to all this chatter and I'm thinking, oh my God, this guy is desperate for a psychiatrist. Um, but he's not even a doctor. I mean, you'll go in a dentist's office and they're a dentist. They're not doctors. They're not physicians. Because they'll, they'll look at the referral cards. They'll only have it for other people that do something with teeth. Like if the tooth died, they'll have an endodontist. If the tooth needs pulled out, they'll have a referral card from an oral surgeon. 
If there's like gunk around the gums, they'll, they'll send it to a periodontist. If the teeth are all crooked, they'll send it to an orthodontist. Uh, if, the, if the human is under 12, they'll send it to a pedodontist. I mean, all they are is a bunch of molar mechanics. And I'll say, well, you do a lot of TMJ, doctor, and this patient's grinding their teeth. Um, did you ask him why he's grinding his teeth? Well, uh, well, he has an interference here and an interference there, and his bite's wrong, and he needs braces, and he needs a equilibration. And I'll say, really? And I'll go in there and say, hey, guy, what's going on in your life? What, what's changed last year? Oh, I'm going through a divorce. Oh, I just got married. Oh, I just got married. My wife's pregnant. Oh, we just had a, a newborn baby, and it's all, it's all sick. Um, I just got fired. I just got a new job. I just got promoted to a regional manager, and I'm now traveling five days a week. I mean, there's a hell of a lot of human attached to those teeth. And if you quit being a molar mechanic in your TMJ departments and realize that all that grunging and grinding and chewing up their teeth and not sleeping has probably nothing to do with whether they got an interference on tooth number four, and it probably has a lot to do with what's going on in their life and their brain capacity. And when I say manage yourself, when you wake up in the morning and you smoke cigarettes and drink coffee instead of having breakfast, um, when you're suffering from mental illness and everybody around you is too afraid to say, Doc, you might have depression. Have you seen a psychiatrist? And then you think, psychiatrist? I'm a doctor. For Christ's sakes, I can't be. I, can't, I don't need a psychiatrist. I mean, how come um, you don't have a referral to a psychiatrist for your TM day patients? How come you don't even have a referral for a psychologist? How come you don't have a different psychologist for a marriage counselor versus a young child? <coughs> These young children that are grinding their teeth. How do you know they're not the five out of 100 that have ADD? How, why do you stop at the mouth and when you don't wake up and exercise three times a week, when you don't wake up and start with breakfast, and when you're smoking cigarettes, drink coffee in the morning and doing alcohol at night, you're not managing yourself and your staff's not going to say to you, doc, you need to pull it together. You need a personal trainer and you need to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, when you're losing your temper at work, when you're throwing instruments, I mean, I love to talk to assistants who only do temporary, and I love it when we bring in a temp hygienist when someone's on vacation, because I love to just stand there and pick their brain with the whole staff, or like take her to lunch, and just nail like 30 quid. Like, like what is the average office? And the cess of dysfunction they talk about is mostly a human relations disaster that starts with the dentist as the core, and almost none of it is technical disasters because the dentist can't do a root canal filling or a crown. So I'm um, Think win-win. See life as cooperative, not a comprehensive arena where success is not achieved at the expense or exclusion of others. Think in hope, growth, and abundancy. Don't think in fear and scarcity. Don't think if you give someone a piece of pizza that your pizza is less. Think about growing the pizza so big that everyone can take a slice so big they couldn't even eat it. Um, you know, we've grown this economy three, two, one and a half to three and a half percent for half a millennium. Just think win-win. Um, see life as cooperative, not competitive okay um, seek first to understand then be understood to build the skills of listening and inspire openness and trust synergize apply the principles of cooperation creativity and value the differences um, renewal preserving and enhancing your greatest asset yourself by renewing the physical spiritual mental and social emotional dimensions of your nature you know I love it um, it really makes me feel good when I talk to like a hygienist Christine who drives an hour to work and I think that she drives by probably 50 dental offices if not a hundred on her way to work and I always say why do you do that and she goes this is like my second family I got a family at home this is like my second family all these people here I love them I trust them I know they'll cover my back I know I mean they they feel they drive to work to see their friends and family and to take part in a dental office that has constancy of purpose it's not a wham bam thinking machine. Everybody's trying to make the most money, and and uh, everybody's everybody's doing what right. And it, it just it admires me the most that my two assistants, Jan and Christine. I mean, I see their whole family. I mean, I see Christine's um, her husband, three children. I see her brother or husband's brothers and children. I see her mom. I see her mother-in-law. I've had I've had my assistant's mom follow an appointment from her mother-in-law. I mean, it's just an honor to me that my assistants have worked for four or five offices before they came on board with me. Jan's been with me 17 years, Chris's been with me years and years, and I get to work on their whole family. I mean, uh, and you can't work on their whole family if they don't have faith in your impressions, if they don't have faith in their labs, if they can't tell, if they don't believe in what you're doing, that this tooth really needs a root canal and this one really needs extracted or needs a filling. I mean, they gotta be sitting there with you 
being extremely transparent. They can't be sitting here assisting Dr. Saddam Hussein, afraid that he's going to do the wrong thing and they can't say anything and he doesn't, they don't want them to do that on their mother or their mother-in-law. Um, think, of, uh, think of healthy, functional relationships. Um, well, look at the dentist that's struggling. They're on their third wife. Um, their average staff's been with them two years. And then they wonder why they have 5,000 patient charts and 4,000 of them quit going to their office and go somewhere else. The same skills to keep your wife, the same skills to keep your staff. And if you can't keep your wife and your staff, you're not going to keep your patients. You just can't have the skills to keep your patients, but not, but not have the skill set to keep your staff. They're all three the same one. And if you're getting a bad grade in any one, you're probably not giving yourself a realistically honest grade in the other. If you have four wives, um, and you tell me your staff's been with you forever, it's probably like one crazy lady's been with you for 20 years while everyone else, the other four positions only last a year for everyone else. I see that routinely. And the doctor says, oh yeah, my friend always been with me for 15 years. Not all 15 years. And then the other four positions, everybody turns every year or two. It's like, okay, you two are crazy and you're running off all the normal people. And you gotta ask staff coming to you, why did you leave your last office? And then when staff leaves your office, you got to find out why. And let me tell you, if your dental office has lost 10 employees in the last five years, it's more likely that those are the good ones and there's some crazy people left behind. And I'll still tell you, the craziest one in all the crazy offices is always a doc. And the doc's too smart and educated to think anything's wrong. So, um, so the, the institutional imperative uh, by Warren Buffett. I love Warren Buffett. I, I love this guy. He actually, to tell you, to show you how dumb I am, freshman year at Creighton University in business class, business 101, we got 10 extra credit points if we go listen to this old man. And that was uh, back in 1980s, 2005. So that was 25 years ago. I'm 43. So here I was, 17. And I'm listening to this guy, and it was Warren Buffett. And, uh, you know, he didn't like technology, didn't like IBM, didn't like Xerox. He liked all these old, simple businesses. And I left, and I said, that is the stupidest guy I've ever listened to in my life. He's an idiot. And then, of course, he grew to be the second richest man in the world. And um, he says that an institution will resist any change in its current direction. So, you know, you got a crazy office manager and a crazy dentist and a bunch of staff turnover. The, the dentist just never is going to look in the mirror and say, maybe I'm crazy and I need to get a psychologist for my office and me. Start with you, yourself, in your own circle. You get better. Then you add a circle and throw your wife in there, spouse. Then you add a circle for your family. Then you add a circle for your office. And if you, if you throw instruments, if you have to scream and yell, if you have to go home at night and drink alcohol or smoke pot, maybe there's something wrong. And maybe something went wrong in your childhood, psychology, content of life, maybe something's wrong with your brain chemistry. But work on yourself and ask yourself, why are you afraid to change? Um, work expands to fill available time. Projects will materialize, soak up available funds. Um, you know, you'll just say something, you know, there'll be a small office with one hygienist and two chairs with two assistants, and then someone will get an idea, well, maybe we should have someone do the instruments. Well, for three chairs, you only got two assistants, a hygienist, one up front and you, and you need someone to do instruments. Well, let me tell you, you hire someone to do instruments, oh, they'll, everyone's busy. No matter how you hire, with labor eating 53% of the S&P 500, labor is half your cost. Average dentist pays 25 to 28 percent labor cost and then they pay themselves about another 25 percent on average but about 30 percent um average overhead and dental off 60 percent that last 30 or 65 percent 35 percent is a uh, cost of you um, but um if you hire a human they'll make themselves busy um any business Craving of the leader, however foolish, will be quickly supported by detailed rate of return and strategic studies prepared by his troops. So, you know, you say something and you're the leader that we're going to do this, however crazy. Everyone will get behind you and go with you and everyone will march over a cliff like a sea of lemmings or a bunch of lemmings running for the ocean. And um, because you have the Saddam Hussein Center, people can't tell you, Doc, that's just a dumb idea. I just don't think that's going to work. I've never seen it work. Uh, this is what the other staff are saying. This is what the patients are saying. You know, you got to be transparent like that. Um, you can't have an, an atmosphere where people bring you bad news and you blow up on them or you get upset or you say, you got to get behind me. If you can't sell your staff, you're not going to sell your patients. Come on. Um, the behavior of peer companies in your industry, whether they're expanding, acquiring, setting executive compensation or whatever, will be mindlessly imitated. 
So when the dentist across the street raises his crown fee 100 bucks, you'll just mindlessly raise yours. Even though that half your phone calls are saying, well, how much do they charge for crowns? They're calling around five offices. In fact, the doctor can't even tell his patients how much something costs. You know, he'll go in there and say, uh, um, yeah, you need a root canal. And the old man will say, well, how much is a root canal? And he'll say, well, you know, I can't even tell you. I'm such a chicken crap. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to uh, leave the room and some heartless woman from the front's going to come back here and tell you how much it costs. And here's a tissue because you're going to need it. You're either going to cry or wet your pants. And uh, I'm going to go hide behind the dumpster. And then some woman from the front walks up and says, you know, a root canal is going to cost a gazillion dollars. And everybody's like, oh, my God. And here you are just mindlessly raising your prices. And I'll say, why did you raise your prices 10%? And you say, well, the earth is a 8,000-mile-wide ball of dirt traveling 60,000 miles an hour on a 365.25-day journey around the sun. And whenever it crosses the planet Pluto, you just raise your fees. I mean, you know what? You raise your fees based on the zodiac symbol. How dumb is that? I mean, how dumb is that? The Earth went around the sun one time, so you raise your fees. That, that's good, Doc. And 90% uh, of your patients are all whining and crying about how much everything costs. One third of Americans lose all their teeth. One third lose half their teeth. And you just raise your prices because the moron across the street did it. That's the institutional imperative by Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha, the second richest man in the United States behind Bill Gates. Um, let me tell you about those dentists across the street. You know, you can only be truly great if you have truly great competition. Now, I'm 43. When I was little, when I was about 20, Muhammad Ali was the greatest. But you know why he was the greatest? Because he had Ernie Shavers, and he had Foreman, and he had all these super great boxers. And the only reason Muhammad Ali went out and worked his butt off is because he had truly great competition. A good boxer needs a good sparring partner or he will deteriorate. The best product should be bought. The best man or woman should be rewarded more. Interfering factors which befuddle this triumph of virtue, justice, truth, and efficiency should be kept to an absolute minimum or should approach zero as a limit. If you want to be truly great, you need truly great competition. And sometimes you're not going to keep your wife because you don't want to be a truly great father. You don't want to be a truly great husband. You'd rather just come home and get hammered. You'd rather sit at a bar all night. You don't want to deal with your kids. Um, your hygienist says, you know, Doc, your dentistry is horrible, and I can't tell people they need a crown and know what you're going to do. And you just say, you know what the easiest thing is? Get the hell out of here. You're out of here. I'm going to hire a dumb, mute hygienist who tells me I'm wonderful. If you want to be truly great, you need truly great competition. Thank you.